Welcome aboard. Now, as a rule, you know, I do just equipment videos and don't get into people, personalities very much because somebody says, you forgot my uncle, my cousin. But in this case, we have to go back to 1915 and a man by the name of John Hertz. The same John Hertz of Hertz Rental Car fame today. But he created a thing in Chicago called the Yellow Cab Company. As a matter of fact, he turned around and bought out the Walden Shaw Company in Chicago who was making taxis. And on June 29th, 1920, the first yellow cab came off the assembly line. In the 1920s, 95% of all the taxi cabs made in the entire country were sold by yellow cab. Now John was a multi, multi-millionaire, self-made man, not especially educated. Back with a million bucks was a million bucks, too. And he foresaw the motor coach as the mobility of it, the practicality of it, as knocking the trolley, coach, uh, trolley uh, car off the, off the face of the map. Consequently, he got involved with Chicago Motor Coach and Fifth Avenue Motor Coach in New York. Chicago Motor Coach, obviously Chicago. And went into the bus building business. 1920 C, 1923 saw the first yellow coach ever come off the assembly line. From 1923 to 1987, uh, including the Canadian division, 140,000 buses would be built. I mean, that's an impressive number. If you took every bus builder on the planet I doubt you could amass 140,000 bus builders, uh, bus units sold. Now you gotta keep your eye open in this video. Things like this Hudson bus in, in Medford, Massachusetts, it's, it ain't no more. Peter Pan bought that outfit out. Now it runs out of that garage. So this, this video is gonna be loaded with stuff like that. Keep your eyes and your ears open. Again, uh, I'm probably going to have a few errors in here, not being a pro announcer or historian, but you're going to have a lot of fun. Now, as we said, we're going back to Chicago. Back to Chicago of the late teens and the early 20s. We already told you about John Hertz. There's a bunch of other people involved, too. Uh, a fellow by the name of Durant, Al Sloan, who headed up GM, Charles McCullough, John Ritchie, George Green. As we said, this is not so much on individuals as it is on the companies itself. Now in 15, Hertz uh, and Shaw started the Yellow Cab Company and on June 29th uh, of 1920, deeply established and uh, owned about roughly about 80 percent of all the taxi cabs in America with his Yellow Cab system and changed the name of his manufacturing company too from uh, the Shaw Livery Company to uh, the Yellow Cab Manufacturing Company. Now in the meantime, without going into too many details which would take more than this tape can handle, he managed to get control of one of the, uh, the Chicago Motor Coach, uh, become one of the leading stockholders in it and, and uh, saw the future uh, for buses in, in the cities is, uh, is, you know, a very economical form of transportation. Now here is one of the very, very early cars. 
Now, these coaches were built by the St. Louis uh, car company, the trolley coach manufacturing people, and they were called tractor units. They were front-wheel drive, and they were, they were doing pretty good. Uh, they had a, a, a run that went up the avenue, and uh, certain runs ended at the, the famous Edgewater Beach Hotel, which was quite the show place of its day. You can see one of the little tractor units right down in the corner there. St. Louis car, double decks. Here are some of them on Lincoln Park Drive. Now these were very unique, and as we said, uh, when when Chicago Motor Bus got in trouble, uh, John Hertz came on board big time. And then they decided they might take a stab at building some buses themselves. John Saar in New York, Fifth Avenue Coach, was building their own coaches. Pretty much replicas of Dijon Boutons uh, uh, and other European cars, Dalmas and whatnot. And these St. Louis cars, incidentally, they, they, there's a cute story here, and this is, I, I think, how the word tank got into the English language. Not as a, a weapon, but in, as, a, as a sort of a nickname for a bad vehicle. These St. Louis car coaches were called tanks. Everybody on the avenue called them tanks. Everybody in Chicago called them tanks. So John created this. Now this was the Fifth Avenue coach, and uh, in 1923 when John created, uh, John Hurst created the Yellow Coach Manufacturing Company, this was the prototype that they, they sort of built first. The number 500 here was the first girl on, well, shall we say rubber, hard rubber tires. And here in Chicago is a really crude picture of the first buses being manufactured. Then the famous Z-Series was born. Now in the meantime, General Motors was, well, we'll get back to that in a second. Let me not get ahead of myself here. What happened was that Fifth Avenue Motor Coach, the principles of Fifth Avenue Motor Coach, and John Hertz's Chicago Omnibus, along with People's Motor Transport, in St. Louis formed a consortium called the Omnibus Company. And later on down the pike you'll see that they pretty much duplicated their paint schemes and everything as we get later on in years here. But here's one of the first Z's. The Z's were so successful with building, they started to build hundreds of them in, uh, in, in the early 20s. Actually, uh, I think 1922, yeah. Yeah, 1922. Again, one of the early Z's. Now, it's awfully hard to ascertain here, but the seats were covered in winter, but there was a wide open to the air corridor right between on either side of the coach. So it was covered to here, it was covered to here, and then down the middle of the coach was still wide open to the air. Of course in the summertime she was totally exposed. Now this is Peoples down in uh, St. Louis. In 1925 Hertz spun off the, or shall we say, the new Omnibus Corporation. There was many people involved by now. Wrigley of the famous uh, chewing gum fame and all that, but uh, they spun off people's motor. Uh, they got 25 million dollars for it. And I want to tell you, back in 1925, that was something. However, Fifth Avenue Coach and Chicago Motor Coach would remain uh, allied and owned by each other until the the, the event of UMTA. Initially, the interior of the, the first coaches were simply 
wooden benches, essentially. That's all. What, what else can you say except wooden benches? You can see them pictured right here. Now the early, the very early coaches, of course, had conductors just like in England, and you boarded like in England uh, through the back of the coach outside in the open air. Hello, American ingenuity. Soon put an end to that. You boarded and went up this stairwell here. But there was something much more important than just getting the people out of the elements as well. See, now you could get rid of the customer, the, the conductor. The bus could be run by just one operator. They started adding wicker seats uh, and seats with springs in them, much more comfortable for people. So they were off and running all right. 1925 saw the plant greatly expanded. This is part of a humongous order that was going to Philadelphia. I mean, take a look at this. Absolutely, unequivocally, impressive to any manufacturing concern. The early coaches uh, were constructed body-wise mainly of wood, metal sheeting on the outside, but primarily wood. So in the, in, the, in the early days, carpenters were very, very important in the construction of buses, just like the mechanic was. One reason why you don't see a lot of old, really old yellow coaches still hanging around too much is because of the wood. Some of them that were bought for use out in the desert still exist uh, as restored vehicles. A couple of them are waiting for restoration, but the vast bulk of them all went by the wayside. Now, there was several other bus builders in the world at the time one of them being GMC General Motors Corp who built both trucks and buses uh, they were doing okay this little GMC was running around the streets of Jersey in 1922 Alfred Sloan who was the brass hat for GMC went on over to sit and talk with John Hertz and his principals and in June of 1925 General Motors truck would be sold to Yellow Cab Manufacturing and thus the name of Yellow Cab Manufacturing in August 17, 1925 was changed to Yellow Truck and Coach Manufacturing August uh, 26th. And henceforth, Yellow Truck and Coach would be known. Now, there were other people in the world building buses, of course. Some, and actually, in, in many ways, they had a great head start on GM. They got like white motors here. You remember that Edgewater Beach Hotel you saw just a few minutes ago? Well, this was their specially built white. It was a regal coach, I want to tell you. Ender bodied. But white was doing exceedingly well. And white was building something that GM was not building yet, and that was buses for over the road. Then there was Fagel. Now, Fagel was truly the biggie. They built a full line of coaches, just like White. You could buy transits. But in the meantime, the Fager boys, they sold out their operation to ACF, ACF, American Car and Foundry, ACF, who got into the 
bus building business in a big way. ACF even took a stab at building double deckers. These were for Detroit, although they were later cut down to single decks. As we said, there was Mac who was building again this line of uh, parlor cars for over the road use as well as city coaches. Yellow Coach countered with their why for the over the road market. This was their first attempt, well, relatively early in the game. Uh, the whys were quickly embraced and started showing up in garages everywhere. Of course, the why refers to the chassis, and while there were many buses built, this one was built for uh, John Hertz, his private coach. Uh, they would have different appearances. It, 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 it did tended to con it tended to confuse quite a few people, as uh, in those days, remember, it was body on chassis. It wasn't an integral monocoque coach yet. Or they were showing up, or were they being bought? Colonial coach on her way into Syracuse. She would shortly become the, the first Eastern Greyhound Lines. Another Y, built for Pacific Northwest operator who couldn't allow his mail or baggage to be exposed to the elements because the Pacific Northwest has tremendous amounts of rain. And he decided to build an enclosed cabinet up in the top of the bus. This is a circa 1925 the Y was coming on line. Boston and Maine Railroad created Boston to Portland service uh, using Ys. Well, this particular version here uh, with the, the bender body was sort of a suburban coach. The New England Transportation Company, which was a subsidiary of the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad, would be very big GM buyers. Had an, almost at once a bunch of Ys equipped to their special uh, specifications. When transportation would remain pretty much a GM buyer to the demise of the company, except at the close of World War II, when they needed some equipment in a hurry, they did get some IC41 Brills. Now here is a sort of a very important General Motors coach in the fact that this is the W. The first experimental one was built in Chicago, but the rest of the production was at the new Pontiac, Michigan plant. 1928 saw them building coaches in Pontiac, and this is where they would stay uh, until they went out of the business. Eleven hundred and sixty-eight of these units, these coaches, would be built until she was finally phased out. Note the very first early uh, rear emergency door. Me. I very nearly forgot the coach she was derived from, the X. The X was built uh, from 1924 to 28. It could be it, it, it could be available in either a, a city transit version like this here. Better things on the inside. Uh, you see spring seats here, all leather covered. They had not yet disco discovered the large clutch of wild naga, so there was no naga hide. Cannonball lines, which ran from Chillicothe, Ohio, down to Huntington, West Virginia. Indiana now all of those X's you saw there stem from this the original little prototype they figured oh we can we can 
take her up in the air. Every every seat had a door. So they, uh, with the X, they started thinking more in the terms of like buses where people could stand up, walk around, and that type of thing. They then came the little W. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the model U. That's not a W. It would evolve into the model U. That model W, I'm sorry, this is the model U. Numbers, 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 and more numbers. Again, the Model W's, Model U's that helped secure their position even a little stronger in, in the, uh, the coach field. They were off and running now. Then, of course, we come into the, the big gun, the Z's. series would be extremely successful. Extremely. An early New Britain transportation. They would attract the attention of the mighty public service of New Jersey's one of the largest fleets of buses that ever existed. Over 2,000, well over 2,000 buses in the public service fleet. And then there was another new guy coming on by the name of C.H. Will Motors. C.H. Will was doing some incredible stuff with over-the-road coaches. Magnificent heating systems for, for the for the time period in this, the state of the art of its day, and attracting some pretty heavy attention from Yellow Coach. The reason why it attracted so much attention because C.H. Will Motors was owned by the mighty Greyhound Corporation. Greyhound had grown by leaps and bounds, and of course Sloan's boys there they were smart marketers and they were smart people they could see right off the bat that this Greyhound was going to fly. They even purchased a bus line in the Shenandoah to keep Greyhound's expansion from going up the Shenandoah in an effort to try and make them come over to the uh, Yellow Coach uh, camp. There was just one thing wrong, though. Bogan, Wickman, and Caesar were pretty adamant guys. Well, that cramped their style. They just figured, well, the hell, we'll run around the Shenandoah. It'll hurt, but it won't kill us. So GM then came up with another alternative. Says, look, sell us all your patterns. We'll sell you the line through the Shenandoah, and you'll have your direct link. And we will build buses to your order. You will get preferential treatment, much like Chicago Fifth Avenue, or actually Omnibus. I've got to remember Chicago and Fifth Avenue were Omnibus Corp of America. And public service. Well, Wickman, Bogan, and Caesar weren't dummies either. And they figured, eh, it might not be that bad. Besides, we could spin off the bus building division. We'll do it. And Greyhound Garages, coast to coast, the mighty yellow Z series would show up. Now, the first ones were Z240s, and then, of course, the mighty Z250. 
it was the wheelbase that uh, that's what we're talking about here. One had a 240 inch wheelbase, one had a 250 inch wheelbase. She was quite a car though. Oh boy. Quite a car indeed. As a matter of fact, the yellow Z250 would put yellow coach smack dab at the head of the pack as far as inner city cars. Not that terribly far ahead of ACF bro, but they were becoming head of the pack. Would you not kill for one of those old personalized signs there from Picnic Greyhound Lines? Isn't that absolutely awesome? If one's in existence anywhere, I have no idea where it would be. A young Don Coffin shot this picture of the yellow Z250. Wait, no, that is not a Z250. It's a yellow coach 670 derivative of a Z250. Confusing, huh? You bet. It's wilder. They were not exclusive Greyhound cars either. They managed to get them sold off pretty darn good to the Auckland Railroad. Here again, New England Transportation. They'd be buying the Z250 big time. Again, a division of the New York, New Haven, and Hartford. Of course, it was the the railroads of America that built America's vast inner city bus system, basically. Missouri Pacific. Oh yeah, you guessed it. Missouri Pacific Railroad. A really prestigious purchase was made by Augustus J. Bush of the Budweiser Brewing Company. This car was not a seated coach. It was a it was a house car. Not only that, you can still see this bus today at the Museum of Transportation uh, in St. Louis, Missouri. It's alive and well there.